Welcome everybody again for our session, for our second session today. The first keynote, which will be given by Alex Gentman, who is the Vice President of Engineering at Qualcomm Technologies and has been responsible for the security of Qualcomm products for quite some time. Alex is also one of the main hosts of the Qualcomm Mobile Security Summit, which has, as many of you will probably know, always addressed a very similar community to the Android Security Symposium. And if I'm informed correctly, the next edition of this Qualcomm Security Summit will be held in 2021. And we'll, of course, as organizers, we'll do our best not to have it collide as it so nearly did sometime in the past. With that, we're very much looking forward to your talk. Alex, over to you and to San Diego. Thank you, Renee, for the introduction. Thanks for hosting me. Uh, you know, when Renee uh, invited me to speak, you know, I asked him, okay, so what do you want me to talk about? He told me like anything you want to. Uh, so you kind of have to be careful what you wish for. Um, so I reflected on, you know, what can I talk about? And I wanted to talk about how I've seen kind of how my thinking about the evolution of uh, security in the products that we make has evolved or has progressed, um, how I see that security evolving um, and kind of what I see we can do uh, to improve and accelerate that process. <coughs> Let me see. Okay. Quick intro, you know, uh, on top of what Renee already said, like Renee said, my name is Alex. I work at Qualcomm. I've been at Qualcomm essentially, you know, forever since the end of last century. I joined as an intern. Um, here's before and after. I think Qualcomm has been pretty good to me. Um, I think I've been, you know, some used to Qualcomm as well. I've been working on security there since basically since 2000. So I spent the last 20 years uh, working on improving the security of mobile products. Um, used to be a real security engineer. These days, I mostly make slides you know, badly. Few disclosures. Um, it's still early here, so I, technically I haven't clocked in yet. Uh, so I'm here in my personal capacity, right? Uh, I'm gonna be sharing some personal opinions. Please don't contribute them to Qualcomm. Please don't get me in trouble with my management. So I wanted to do something different today. I wanted to give an optimistic security talk because I'm that rarest of unicorns, an optimistic security engineer. Uh, this may come as a somewhat of a surprise to those of you that know me, because I do try to maintain a fairly kind of solid facade of skepticism and devil's advocacy. Uh, but that's mostly just so that I can pass myself off as a real security engineer and fit in with my peers. I have, in fact, I have the distinct honor of having been called the most depressing person he has ever met uh, by Chris Evans. This was back when Chris led Google's Project Zero. And I think at some conference over drinks, I tried to explain how patching works in the mobile ecosystem to him. Um, but you know, nonetheless, I assure you kind of deep at heart, I'm an optimist. And that optimism is not born of uh, you know, any sense of naivete, right? I've spent enough years in this industry to feel like I've really been, uh, you know, I've seen inside the total perspective vortex, I've seen the kind of the unimaginable infinite complexity of the mobile ecosystem and my own insignificance within it. Uh, you know, a tiny marker, a microscopic dot on a microscopic dot that says you are here. Uh, but uh, in spite of that, or as I'll talk more perhaps um, because of that, um, I, excuse me, uh, I have developed a rather kind of optimistic outlook. Um, yeah, so I understand that um, kind of a cheery security engineer uh, is a bit of an oxymoron and does not naturally engender trust and confidence. So I must first build up some credibility with this audience by basically, you know, scaring you and telling you how everything is broken. So here we go. Okay. We're all doomed. Hold on, let me make this better. Okay. Um, okay, there we go. Okay, so we're all doomed. And 
I, I have to admit, kind of, I was putting the slides together. You know, this is not as shocking these days as it used to be, because you know now, you know, you open the news and you have this like infinite array of choices to be doomed by. Uh, but that aside, I'm talking about a very specific thing, um, particularly that we're doomed to never really, uh, never fully understand our own creations. And it's kind of for engineers, it's hard to accept, right? Because as engineers, we have this um, God complex, right? Like we're the creators, like I created this thing. And as the creator of this thing, um, you know, I should be able to create it just to, you know, to do exactly what I want and just what I want. Moreover, like there's almost like a sense of entitlement that just because you create it, you have to really understand how it works. And it's not really uh, kind of th this sense of entitlement is not really supported by available, uh, you know, evidence, right? This is kind of, you know, one cute counterexample, like, you know, any idiot can make one, like, you know, we made two, still have no idea how they work, right? Although granted, this is a little bit out of realm of engineering. But the reason we will never fully understand our own creations is complexity. Right, this is a somewhat random uh, picture I got when I Googled for software complexity. This is a chart of relationships between classes in the Hibernate Java library. Right, and you have to keep in mind that this in itself is again, just a microscopic dot on a microscopic dot within some larger system, right? And kind of the details don't matter, right? I just wanted to illustrate you know, something that shows complexity. Perhaps a better choice would have been uh, kind of like a modern system on a, ch you know, the diagram of a modern system on a chip, but you know that would require me to talk to way too many lawyers. So I just Googled for something instead. Uh, so yes, yeah, so, so so basically, and the complexity of the things that we're creating, the complexity of technological creations, is kind of rapidly approaching the complexity of living organisms. The um, you know, if you look at the kind of the number of transistors uh, in modern systems, you know, the number of bits of state in, in software, it is immense. And ironically, the very mechanism we use to cope with this complexity and to build even more complexity is the very thing that limits our understanding of what it is that we've built. And I'm talking about abstractions, right? Because abstractions provide a simplified model of the system, right? They provide a, a simplified model of the layer below to enable the builder, you know, the designer, the engineer, kind of to free up their cognitive capacity to deal with more complexity at the layer above. And the keyword here is simplified, right? The kind of the paradox of the abstraction is that it can only be useful if it is wrong. Because if it doesn't simplify, if it doesn't hide some information, it doesn't provide its kind of core value. So I like to use this diagram to illustrate the point, right? We have a nice kind of simplified abstraction, straight lines, uh, right angles on the left. We have reality, which is still a very simplified view, but bear with me, right? It's a bit more complex, right? You have the curved, um, curved corners that are harder to model. And obviously if you overlay the two, there's gonna be some delta. And in our field, there's a very specific technical term for that difference between abstraction and reality, right? Like we call it a vulnerability. And uh, if you think about it, really most, if not all types of vulnerabilities fit this metaphor pretty well, right? So, you know, like we miss um, buffer overflow vulnerabilities because the abstraction of a function call hides the kind of the detail of passing the return address through the stack. And we miss integer overflow vulnerabilities because the abstraction of arithmetic in C and its derivatives uh, looks so much like the arithmetic we learned in primary school and hides the truncation and wraparound of the modular arithmetic underneath. Uh, and then we miss things like row hammer because the abstraction of linear random access memory hides all the details of the physics of DRAM and you know how that works. And, uh, in fact, you know, this is also the reason why, you know, in my view, so much of the security education is really about unlearning the lies taught in the core computer science curriculum. Right? So 
an abstraction. Um, oh, yeah, I, I should say, by the way, right, and if you zoom in, kind of this problem is fractal, right? Because again, the difference between abstraction and reality, you know, reality is very messy, right? Like it doesn't have nice uh, uh, kind of straight lines. And again, the, the more you zoom in, the more kind of delta you see. So what happens is, right, like as a builder of a system, right, the designer thinks that they're working on kind of these um, solid layers, solid bricks, with kind of no gaps between them that all fit in. Um, and in reality, so these vulnerabilities. Um, and, you know, Sergey Bratis has this, uh, you know, very eloquent saying, layers of abstraction become boundaries of competence. And that is, of course, what they're meant to be, right? Again, the abstraction is meant to hide the complexity of the layer beneath. But that means that kind of a person working at the top of this pyramid, right? Like, so a developer working on a, I don't know, a cat filter for your, uh, you know, for some camera app, will never understand the full complexity, the full details of the entire system below, right? You know, the language runtime garbage collection and the operating system permission model. And, uh, of the you know CPU cache hierarchy um, and the physics of DRAM and the chemistry of silicon dopants and the you know in the chip right it, like it's not going to happen like they will never understand the full thing like and none of us will really fully understand how our computers work um, but that's how modern technology kind of advances right like we keep adding layer upon layer onto this kind of tower um, and really it's all kind of tightly packed layers. It's not just layers of abstraction, it's tightly packed layers of vulnerabilities. Okay. So hopefully that was sufficiently kind of demoralizing um, to convince you that I am indeed a, like a real security professional. And normally this is where a security talk would end, right? We're doomed. Thank you, please don't forget to follow me on Twitter. Okay, I believe we have you know some time for Q&A. And that used to be me, right? Like, you know, early on in my career, I actually got the nickname Dr. Evil. You know, this was the early 2000s. Uh, Austin Powers movies were still popular. Uh, and I picked up a reputation for coming up with essentially these like movie plot uh, business models, you know, for, you know, a billion dollars uh, that attackers could build by, uh, you know, exploiting different vulnerabilities. And keep in mind, this was before, uh, you know, we could just say, hey, it's a bug, fix it, right? When we have to go through the whole dance of, well, but why would anybody ever do that? And luckily, we've sort of moved on from that largely. Um, so anyway, like I said, so I got this nickname for, you know, all my dire predictions of, you know, how things will go wrong. And, you know, things were getting fixed, right? Like, you know, we had some success, but, you know, things are never fixed as quickly as you would hope. So, you know, I'm, I was perpetually worried about all of, you know, my dire predictions coming true. But years went by and, you know, people went online and they banked and they shopped. And, you know, there was some crime, but there's always crime and the overall crime rate went down. And, you know, like cities did not burn down or, you know, cities didn't burn, financial system did not collapse. Well, okay, like all of those things happened, but none of it happened because of a you know buffer overflow in, in the phone or anything like that, or, or in software at all. So after a while, I had to reconcile with the fact that the world kept on spinning. And that's what led me to kind of make current sunny outlook. That, you know, a realization that despite all of this complexity, like even if we can't understand it, right? But despite all of that complexity, you know, the products that we make you know, evolved kind of resilience to the threats that they face in the world around them, you know, almost like living organisms. So <clears throat> hopefully, uh, you know, some of you recognize the title of my talk, The Evolution of uh, Secure Things, as a reference to Henry Petrosky's book, The Evolution of Useful Things. And uh, in this book, Petrosky lays out the history of how Kind of common household objects like the paper clip and the fork came, you know, to look the way they look. How do they get their current shapes? And essentially, his central thesis is that 
form does not follow function, but form follows failure. Uh, and what he means by that is uh, you don't get the shape of a paperclip, for example, by getting some you know, smart person to sit down and think really hard about kind of, okay, what's the ideal kind of minimalist tool that, or you know, mechanism that can hold a few leaf, uh, you know, loose uh, leaves of paper together. Okay. The way you get a paperclip is through, or anything else is, right, is through many generations of uh, kind of iterative uh, trial and error, right? Somebody comes up with something and it works kind of well, kind of okay, but then people observe the ways in which it is lacking and they try to improve on it. Like more precisely, kind of not every alteration is an improvement, right? You know, some alterations lead you kind of to an evolutionary dead end, but this, you know, the process of, you know, trying and seeing what sticks and what makes things better is what eventually leads you to some uh, ideal shape. Now, Notably, he points out that this evolutionary process doesn't necessarily converge on one ideal uh, form factor, right? On one ideal shape. Uh, the kind of most obvious example are eating utensils, right? This is, you know, the problem of conveying food from, you know, plate to mouse. This is all this time. Uh, you know, th this is human, this is something humans have been doing forever. Um, and yet we see different cultures come up with vastly different tools for the problem, right? You know, again, most notably the fork and chopsticks. Right? So it's not like there's one ideal solution. You can have multiple solutions and which one you end up with kind of depends on the evolutionary path you take. And when I read this book, I was struck by how much about, you know, Petrovsky's description about the evolution of everyday things resonated with me and kind of reminded me of uh, how I view the evolution of security of things, right? Again, the similar thing is, you know, how we keep trying things and we keep improving on the failures of the, or the shortcomings of the past generation. And, you know, I think some people view it as a failure of our profession that we don't get things right on the first try. Um, but I'm not sure anything other than this kind of evolutionary approach is really reasonable to expect. Um, and like moreover, like with most evolutionary processes, the outcomes are far, like far better than they have any right to be. Right? And I think over time, commodity computers have become, you know, very resilient to the common threats around them. And look, they'll never be perfect, right? And there are always gaps, but they continue to evolve. Now, I think understanding the evolutionary um, forces in play can help us speed up the process. And one of the kind of one of the most, I think, critical forces in play is consumer demand. So I believe that in consumer markets, uh, in particular, security is, you know, can be a differentiator. Security does become a differentiator, but it is the last differentiator, meaning that it really begins to impact purchasing decisions only after, you know, the rate of introduction of new features slows down. So, and if, you know, when essentially when the product becomes commoditized, right? Like when all products more or less look the same, then people want reliability, you know, security and the broader reliability and safety. Uh, and, you know, we can look at a few historical examples, right? I think um, if you remember what it was like to buy a PC in the 90s, right? By the time you brought it home and finished setting it up, it was essentially an outdated pile of junk. Right? Like you could go back to the store a few weeks later, buy something that was twice as fast for half the price. It's, you know, like every uh, kind of, you know, you would longingly look at every ad that came in about, you know, what new computers are available and, you know, keep dreaming about like when you can upgrade. So in that climate, every time something went wrong, um, you know, every time you had a crash, every time you had a virus infection, it was annoying, it was frustrating, and it was one more excuse to do what you really wanted, which is to get rid of this one and go buy a new one. Okay. Then at around 2000, the hardware is fast enough. We get out of order execution CPUs, we get hyper threading, you know, great things, never look back, right? Uh, the operating system is stable enough. Uh, you know, productivity software is great. You know, Office has all the features you would ever want, plus the, you know, paperclip thingy that pops up. 
Uh, and all of a sudden, you don't want a new one. You want this one to keep working, right? Like, yeah, you know, you could go buy a new one and, you know, the plastic is a bit nicer and the screen is a little bit crisper. But, you know, suddenly upgrading is a chore. You have to move all of your files and reinstall all your apps and reconfigure all the settings. And it's like, I just want this one to work, right? And so, so I think it's not a coincidence that Microsoft's big, you know, trustworthy uh, computing push, they're rolling out of their secure development lifecycle, uh, came around that time, right? Bill, Bill Gates' uh, trustworthy computing memo came out in early 2002. I think a similar thing can be observed in the automotive industry. And I know car comparisons are dicey, but kind of bear with me. Uh, and, and I apologize, you know, a lot of my examples are going to be US centric, but I think they, uh, hopefully they uh, kind of carry over uh, to, to other um, places as well. But at least in the US, right, um, kind of looking at the data, widespread availability of convenience features like FM radio and air conditioning and automatic transmission predate availability of safety features like seat belts and you know airbags and anti-lock brakes and again as i said like even the basics like seat belts and it's only kind of after cars become commoditized right so uh you know what i remember about for example car commercials in the again in the 90s and the early 2000s they weren't advertising different features they were all advertising crash safety ratings and warranty you know, periods, you know, how long the warranty is, right? So by that time, um, all the focus has shifted to you know, safety and reliability. That's at least until the more uh, recent uh, automotive renaissance based on uh, computation and connectivity. And I, I think it wasn't all, you know, Buck Track and Ralph Nader either, right? Without dismissing or diminishing the role of activism, I think it's important for us to recognize the other forces in play and to understand why advocacy efforts succeeded at the point that they did. Right? Because it wasn't like Windows security was great throughout the 90s and nobody said anything, right? It wasn't like there wasn't, you know, pressure um, on Microsoft to do something about it. And, you know, prior to Nader's book coming out, it wasn't like people weren't dying by, you know, tens of thousands every year in the U.S. alone for decades leading up to that period. But something else happened in that market in the market at that time to kind of to allow that transition. And I think we're seeing a similar thing with smartphones now, right? Uh, you know, as we've made the transition from um, um, sorry, yeah, so, so I, I would argue that today the smartphone is the most secure device, digital device that most people own, right? And it wasn't the case you know, 25, 20, 15, even 10 years ago, right? Probably, yeah, maybe even five, I'm not sure about that. Um, but, you know, once the rate of introduction, uh, once the rate of, kind of introduction of new features has flattened out, we saw this rather sharp transition of key market players to focus on security. And it, it, like, it's easy to forget how sudden that change was and that it wasn't always like that. And it kind of makes sense when you think about it, both from the kind of from the vendor and from the consumer point of view, right? So from the vendor point of view, security is not free, right? Security does cost money um, and it costs time to market. So when you're in the mode where um, the rate of innovation is high and people want new features, and you know, there's you know, people are lining up around the block um, on product release day. Right. A vendor that delays the release of their product to add more security in without kind of increasing the feature set, and that's almost a suicidal move. Right. And at the same time, right, like looking at it from the customer perspective, we can see it as potentially a rational choice as well though not necessarily kind of conscious and explicitly thought out. Because if you, if you look at security as the ratio of benefit to risk, then during periods of rapid innovation, 
your best way to optimize that ratio may be to capitalize on the skyrocketing benefit. Right? And it's only once, it's only once that uh, flattens out that your only way to improve that ratio begins to now kind of decrease the denominator and to draw down the risk. And look, this forum, I think, provides us with a perfect example. Right? We're doing this on Zoom. Right? Zoom is not exactly known for their uh, security first posture. And yet the organizers, you know, uh, despite their you know, considerable security expertise, decided that the features offered by the platform outweigh whatever you know, security risks it brings. So clearly, you know, from a business perspective, Zoom made the right call. You know, now having captured you know, significant market share, they can afford to invest in security and make the program better, make the tool better. And of course, kind of in an essence, as consumers, we have endorsed that choice right? because that's the tool we chose to use. We didn't choose uh, something that focused on security instead. Um, and I think so, so cases like Zoom, right, bring up the question, okay, well, why can't uh, vendors focus on security earlier on? Like, why don't we see more companies kind of, you know, why do they leave it um, kind of un until the last minute? I think pictures like this help us to understand why, right? So this is, most of you are probably familiar with this picture. This is kind of the canonical uh, illustration of survivorship bias. So during the Second World War, uh, US military wanted to know where they should reinforce their planes, their bombers. And so they surveyed planes coming back from mission, uh, from missions, and they mapped out all the areas that get hit by enemy gunfire, and they created this sort of hit heat map. And the initial proposal was, okay, well, we, you know, clearly we have to reinforce the areas that are getting hit more. Until a statistician looked at it and pointed out that they're only looking at planes that survive the damage and return to base, right? The areas that are blank on this chart it's not like enemy fire is miraculously missing those parts of the plane. The more likely explanation is that when, uh, when that part of the plane gets hit, it is fatal, right? And planes that get hit in those places do not return to base. So rather than you know, dealing with damage that's not fatal, that can be dealt with after the plane returns, they have to armor the places that are left blank here. <clears throat> so how does it relate to the topic that we were discussing? So I think similarly, I think there are lots of companies that focus on security early on. Unfortunately, the choices that we make as consumers, unfortunately, or you know, maybe maybe I shouldn't assign a value judgment to, but you know, the choices we make as consumers, um, kind of, these companies don't often survive long enough uh, for us to know their names. Right? You know, early on, focus tends to be on usability and features and you know, things that consumers want and the benefit that they can get out of it. And only after that, um, companies begin to focus on security. Now, there's another reason why uh, kind of, I think security takes this, um, go through this evolutionary process. And that's because the product itself evolves. You can't secure it until you know what it is. So, like this is one of the early Qualcomm phones. I love this phone, by the way. Probably still one of, one of my favorite phones of all time. But, you know, properly, kind of quote unquote, properly securing this phone in 1995 would have precluded pretty much every feature of a modern smartphone, right? Like, I mean, I, I can imagine a conversation. Let, let me get this straight. You want to connect this thing to the internet and you want to allow people to run third-party code on it? And, and I remember those concerns, right? I remember as phones began to add more and more features, you know, camera and apps and so on. There were many kind of, you know, especially within the security community, uh, there was angst and concern that kind of this is greatly expanding the attack surface, uh, which was correct, right? And, you know, people were saying, look, I just want a single purpose device. I want the phone to be a phone, and, you know, nothing else. And while, Again, as a security engineer, like those concerns were valid. Yes, the attack surface of a modern device is much greater than, than you know, if a phone uh, 20, 25 years ago. And yet, 
miraculously, I claim it is much harder to get uh, remote code execution on a modern device than it is on the phone from 1995. So somehow the system of evolution works remarkably well. And I claim that actually the security of consumer devices has been a huge success. In fact, I'll, like, I'll go a step for a giant leap further. I will claim that the software um, in consumer devices today is more resilient than anything the consumer market has ever seen. So think about some of the things you have in your house, right? Like an armchair, coffee maker, you know, this is a bag, but you know, say imagine glasses. I'm assuming everybody in this audience has glasses, eyeglasses. Uh, and these are all things designed for household use. You know, they look nice, they provide excellent functionality, you know, they're priced right for their target market, um, and so on. But they also all require careful handling, right? Like they're not designed to be abused in any way. Uh, you know, how I like to say, there's nothing in my house that can survive a three-year-old with scissors, nothing. But in fact, like the entire phrase, you know, this is why we can't have nice things, is based on the, pre on the premise that nice things require careful handling and the, you know, and, and if we don't handle them really carefully, then they break. Now, there's another class of products that is meant to go into public spaces, you know, like a park bench, uh, you know, train station vending machine, a shopping cart, right? You know, these things are a little bulkier, they don't look as nice, they're not, the functionality they provide is very, very limited, and they're a lot more expensive, but, you know, they can take, you know, a, sun beating right they can take a scratch you know maybe you know a baseball bat here or there so, so the interesting thing is things like phones like smartphones are in both places at once right on the one hand this is a consumer device it has to feel nice and look nice and provide great functionality um, and be reasonably priced on the other hand the software it runs is connected to the internet so it's essentially in the public space all of the time and we now have this expectation that the software should be able to withstand not just kind of casual abuse from hyperactive kids and bored teenagers, but even targeted attacks from trained professionals. Now, pause for a minute to think about the significance of this change. This is fundamentally, this is a fundamentally different expectation than consumer goods, you know, than we've ever had for consumer goods before. And really, I didn't think this was possible, right? Like, in fact, uh, you know, I have, I, I looked at my notes, I have notes back from 2011, where I postulate that, you know, consumer goods, including software, cannot be made vandal proof because I just couldn't find a suitable preference. But, you know, here we are. I mean, look at, uh, sorry, like, look at this chart from zero view. And I, I know it's a marketing slide and, and, you know, we have to take it with a grain of salt, but anyway. what else in your house costs upwards of $2 million to break? Okay, and maybe, you know, maybe remote attacks are not a fair comparison. Like, look even at basics, like pin bypass and, you know, local privilege escalation. Like, who has a lock that's, that costs $100,000 to pick? Who has a door that costs $200,000 to break down? Like, it just, it doesn't happen. So I, I think this is incredible. And I, you know, I, I still find it hard to come to terms with this. Right? So I, I think whatever process is in play here is clearly producing very good results. And like, I, I'm not trying to say that, look, we just should sit back and enjoy the ride. I, I think we, you know, we should look at what can we do to accelerate this process. And, you know, evolution works by, you know, iteratively trying new mutations and, you know, seeing what works and uh, adopting that, right? So for that, for it, you need two things, right? You need a useful utility function, some sort of a feedback metric. So, you know, whether it's you know, survival in, uh, you know, in biology or, uh, you know, path coverage and fuzzing or whatever it is, right? but something to tell us that we're moving in the right direction. And, uh, 
you know, and we want fast iteration. Now, I think in the context that we're describing, the speed of iteration is not an issue. I think we're iterating fast enough. Or, you know, I don't think we have um, a problem with, you know, how often, you know, how fast products come out, how fast we try new things. Uh, but I do think we have a problem with the utility function. I think, you know, the feedback mechanism that the market provides um, and it works, but it's really slow and imprecise, right? We never really know why a product fails, you know, whether it's because of a um, lack of security or because of something else. So what we really want is some sort of rapid, accurate feedback um, to see if the change that we've introduced has made a thing more secure. And remarkably, kind of mind-bogglingly, uh, we have no real way of assessing the security of the thing. And, you know, it's, again, it's just mind boggling that we've gotten this far in this field without being able to answer such a basic question. And in fact, so, so I'm gonna do something now. I'm actually going to contradict something I said earlier, but it's a keynote, I'm, I believe I'm allowed to do that. Um, so I'm going to claim that we actually have no idea if computers are more secure today than they were 20 years ago. So, Kind of follow me on this brief diversion. <clears throat> so let me ask this question about cars and you know car analogy again. Sorry. A car is safer to drive today than they were 40 years ago. How would we answer this question? Right? Well, you know, we can look at safety features, but safety features only tell us that somebody's trying. We don't necessarily know if they have an impact. Uh, we can look at safety tests. Again, safety tests, you know, somewhat predictive, like we think this helps, uh, but we don't really know if that, you know, if a car that does well in a safety test actually results in kind of a safer experience on the road. So ideally what we have is actual data, like actual measurement of harm, right? So in the US, uh, we have this data from the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, NHTSA, Right, and we can look at fatalities per year. And we can see that yes, from the 1970s to today, the number of fatalities per year has decreased significantly. Now there's a complication, of course, because the usage during that time has changed a lot as well, right? The number of people, the number of cars, the amount that people drive has increased drastically as well. So ideally we normalize this kind of units of harm by units of benefit. So let's say we divide it by uh, you know, vehicle miles traveled. Right? And when we look at those stats, we see that the change is even more drastic, right? There's almost a threefold decrease in the number of fatalities per mile traveled from the 1970s to today. So, you know, so we can look at this data and say, okay, great, there's been progress. Now, we don't necessarily know specifically what led to that improvement, whether that was, you know, uh, speed limits or strong enforcement of traffic laws or seat belts uh, or, you know, global warming, whatever it was, right? But we can clearly see that there was improvement. So now we ask the same question about computers. Are computers more secure today than they were, you know, say 25 years ago? So how would we answer that question? Like, what is, what is the data that we would support uh, our response? Like, what, are, what, are, what is our measure of harm? Like, we, we can't even agree on what units to use, right? Is it like ideally somewhere, right? Like we should be able to say, look, you know, this hopefully zero lives lost, but you know, some measure of physical harm, some measure of financial harm. And then we want to again, normalize it by measure of benefit. And I have no idea how we, like what units we would use for benefit, right? Is it per number of transistors in the world, per number of bytes received or transmitted, whatever it is, right? And not having this, not being able to answer this question is really quite bad. In fact, like I think this is the biggest kind of the biggest thing holding back our field. Now, personally, you know, I try to ask myself questions like, okay, so if my budget was doubled tomorrow, like how would the users notice? Like what can the user points to to say that okay, you know, their phone really got more secure? And you know, I like to think that I'm in the business of harm reduction, right, or crime prevention. 
but I can't tell you know, to what extent I'm succeeding without data like this, right? And so you know, the automotive industry has NHTSA data on car fatalities that they can use to assess progress on car safety. And you know, the healthcare industry has CDC data on infections that they can assess improvements in disease prevention. And in the security industry, we have thought leaders, right? And for, you know, for what we lack in evidence of what works, we more than make up for with like really strongly held fanatical beliefs about what should work. So I can try, you know, we have a lot of, you know, like we have maturity models and best practices and guidelines, and, you know, I can measure adherence to those. But if I do that, my job is not about harm reduction. You know, my job is about compliance. I don't want to be in compliance, right? Uh, you know, we can look at kind of decreasing uh, negative press coverage based on CVEs or conference talks, but then my job is PR, and I don't want my job to be PR, right? But look, the, I know great people that work in PR. Some of my you know friends work in PR. That's just not my career choice. I want to be in the business of harm reduction, and for that, I need to be able to measure the actual outcome of my work. I, I know now that there are things like the cyber ITL, right, that look at, you know, analyze the binary or analyze the product and look at which countermeasures are enabled, um, which, uh, uh, you know, unsafe functions are still in use and so on. But again, those things are like uh, looking at safety features, right? It measures effort, you know, how hard is a vendor trying to make their product secure? It doesn't necessarily tell you what the end outcome is. So, in some sense, kind of going back to Zero Idiom's uh, marketing slide, in some sense, this is the best feedback uh, mechanism we have. And and it, you know, it's not a bad one, but it's not ideal, right? Like, and it's sort of it's hard to tell how accurate it is. Um, so kind of I'm coming to the end here. I know uh, we don't have a lot of time. So wrapping up, um, overall kind of, you know, when I look back at this slide, right, this is a very kind of happy, optimistic slide. Like, you know, those are great numbers on the left-hand side to be looking at, right? And I hope, so looking at this, like I hope that I've managed to deliver a somewhat optimistic talk, at least kind of by the uh, security talk standards and convince you that it's not all doom and gloom that consumer products are continuously evolving and becoming more secure, and that your smartphone is arguably the most secure device that you have. Uh, you know, we can see the effect of this evolution, like even our threat models are evolving, right? To the point that, like today, nation state attackers are explicitly part of the threat model. It wasn't like this, it wasn't always like this, it wasn't like this even you know, 15, maybe even 10 years ago, right? Like I remember starting out in this industry and you know, it was, like an explicit position when you're, you know, when you're performing a security analysis, when you're doing threat model, you know, government attackers are out of scope because, you know, th there's not much you can do. And we've moved on since then. Now, I'm not saying we're successfully stopping every government attacker, but it's kind of, it's a realistic goal. It's a, it's a bar that we're actively trying to reach for. And that is a huge change for the better. So when I look at new kind of, um, new fields like IoT, for example, I, I get a sense of deja vu, right? Because I see many of the same concerns coming up as you know what I was seeing during the early days of mobile. The, you know, many of the same concerns that I was raising during the early days of mobile. So, and knowing how that turned out gives me hope, right? So, even as I share a lot of the concerns about the state of IoT security, I remain very optimistic about the fate. Right, but that category, that product category needs some time to mature and stabilize, uh, to evolve, and then you know security of it will evolve too. Now, the reason I think you should kind of believe and embrace my optimistic outlook is my track record of being wrong. Okay, that sounded a bit better in my head the first time around. Uh, what I mean is. It's not just sort of some random thought I had, it is a conclusion based on a falsified hypothesis. In fact, a many years worth of falsified hypothesis. Because I used to believe something different and those different beliefs did not pan out, right? So I reconsidered them and this is 
kind of this is my new outlook. So really, it's science, really. Um, okay, and I, I think that's actually it. So you know, those were the thoughts I wanted to share with you today. Um, and I think we have some time for Q and A. Thanks a lot, Alex. I was right in telling you that you could talk about anything you wanted. This was a great keynote. Thanks for being the remaining, one of the remaining optimistic security <laughs> experts here in the round, because we do need that at conferences. And um, I'm totally with you. Thanks for doing that, because I also strongly believe we are actually in a pretty good place at the moment. Um, there's there are always things that we can improve, and I think we had some interesting talks these two days of where we can improve. But we are starting from a from a pretty high bar already. Also, um, thanks for the Douglas Adams reference. That's <laughs> always a good one. Um, before going through my list of questions that I wrote down during your talk. We already have one in our um, virtual conference venue in the Metromost chat from Daniel Thomas. Daniel, do you want to ask yourself or shall I read? I, I can ask it. Please go um, ahead. So uh, will IoT security only come when the number of providers has consolidated to a relatively small number like with mobile devices or um, say with big tech companies, you basically have to go with one of a small number um, and therefore they have the reason to invest in security because things have settled down a bit. Or, and if that is the case, is there any reason it wouldn't happen with IoT? I don't know, because of the, the being so many different um, application domains, or do you expect that everything will consolidate behind a small number and then we'll get security? So, so, so that, that's an interesting question. Thanks. So I think the two, kind of the, the number of providers and the level of security, um, kind of thinking about it off the top of my head, I think there's probably some correlation there, but not necessarily causation, right? Like I think the two may be driven by the same market forces, right? As you know, early on in the field, there are lots of entrants, lots of people trying different things. As the field becomes mature, uh, it kind of tends to consolidate to a few uh, big players. Um, and it so happens that kind of security evolves uh, along, oops, excuse me, uh, that same um, that same curve uh, as well. And I, I think actually the, the kind of the the slide I had in backup um, that, that I accidentally showed uh, talks a little bit about that point. Maybe I'll go to that. Right. Let me just do that. Well. Uh, so speaking of IRT, right, like, look, these two printers, uh, you know, a few weeks ago when I checked this, right, they think they offer pretty much the same set of features. They have the same price. Um, how can you tell which one is more secure or like is even secure, right? And, you know, maybe this is a counterexample to what I was saying before, that once a product category becomes commoditized, that's when it focuses on security because these things are commoditized, right? Like I don't... Like, I think people go to the store and they just figure out, okay, like, you know, I want a printer that costs like this much or, you know, whatever the cheapest, whatever is uh, in store at Costco and you just buy that uh, printer. Right? There's not really a lot of, I think, feature differentiation for home printers these days. Um, but then the question is, to what extent do consumers care, right? Like how many of us have like, our, our work, you know, have a problem with the security of our printer, like can't get our work done because our printer, you know, is, is being exploited, right? So, you know, you could argue that, look, you know, they reached the level of security that consumers are comfortable with. And, you know, if you made them 10 times more secure, like nobody would notice, right? Uh, so, yeah, so I, I don't know that this was kind of a, a long with an answer. I'm not sure I answered the question. Uh, directly, but I think I think we will see I guess that consolidation and improvement on security that are kind of they'll go hand in hand, but it's not because one is related to the other. Uh, you know, I think you can have many different vendors all improving security, um, but you do have to wait for the um, product category to mature. Uh, you have to figure out what customers are actually comfortable with, what benefit they're really looking to extract from a product, 
and what trade-offs they're willing to make in exchange for that, uh, right? And you don't know that until you try, right? Like, look, I, I can look at Uber, right? Like Uber would have, something like Uber would have been insane to propose uh, like at any large corporation before Uber actually launched, right? Like, look, we're gonna, uh, can you imagine that conversation with the legal team? Like, we're gonna let strangers like get into your car and it, it doesn't happen, right? So, so you have to go kind of through this evolutionary process to see what sticks, what works, what consumers embrace, and then kind of work on securing that. Anyway, no. Coming back to your answer, mm -hmm. um, at which point in your curve would you, in your time curve, would you put current mobile phones? Do you think we are already at the stage where the differentiating factor is becoming to be reliability? Or yeah, I, I, how far away from that are we? No, I, I think for phones, we, I, I, my personal take is look for, for, and it's not a great thing kind of from a business perspective for the industry, uh, but I think we've kind of turned that corner effectively, right? Like, you know, all phones look like this, right? You know, you don't really see lines forming around the block whenever the new, you know, the latest phone comes out. Um, it, you know, people are not treating their, uh, you know, their two-year contract as a prison sentence counting down the days to when, you know, when they can finally uh, get a new phone. At least like, look for myself, right? It's like, uh, it works well. I'm not necessarily looking forward to an upgrade. I know that, you know, for me, really the last few generations of phones, like the upgrade was driven by, uh, you know, battery life, you know, the, the battery degrading and uh, screens getting broken, right? It wasn't because the new phone offered the features that I wanted, it's because my old one stopped working. So in that sense, like, yes, reliability is already a thing. And yeah, like at this point, I do view getting a new phone as a chore, right? Like, okay, now I have to migrate all of my stuff and reset it up. And again, not a great thing for somebody uh, kind of whose salary depends on people buying new phones, but I, you know, from a security engineering perspective, I do think we turned that corner and that is why you see, like I'm not naming names, but you see the big uh, kind of players in the industry kind of made a rather sharp pivot towards uh, kind of strong focus on security. Coming quickly back to your example on printers, um, I, I fully agree that phones are becoming commodity devices these days and there is little difference in terms of features. But do you think that for phones, we already have the, like as consumers, trying to put ourselves into consumers' shoes, do we already have the information? Do we have the transparency on how to decide between the security features, the security stands off multiple phones that you have in your short list of devices that you might go for? For printers, I agree. I wouldn't know where to look for if I wanted to know if it was safe to connect that printer directly to my whatever guest network or not. Do I know for phones if I'm not within this community here? Uh, no, and I, I, I think that's the same answer, right? Like, unfortunately, no, right? And we don't have a good way. And, and like I said, I think part of it is because we don't really have this meaningful feedback function. We don't have reliable crime stats. What you really want to know is, okay, what is my likelihood of being exploited or you know losing money or whatever it is right if i buy this phone mm -hmm. right uh, i think we try to short circuit that and look at features but i think it doesn't necessarily work right so um you know the, the, the worry is that uh, like it, it's possible to slap on a feature without actually making the device more secure right like look i, I can you know if i uh buy uh you know, a, a cheap, you know, a cheap phone that's based on an SOC that's not from Qualcomm, let's say, uh, right? And I slap a secure element to the side of it, it doesn't magically make it secure, right? It doesn't like address the hundreds of kind of LP and RCE bugs that are in there like that. So uh, kind of adding a security feature by itself, right? Just like, you know, adding a safety feature to a card doesn't necessarily mean that you get the outcome that you want. We have to get to the point where we're actually able to measure outcomes and look back and say, okay, look, clearly, you know, you know, people that have bought this type of device ended up being safer than people that bought that type of device. We do have another question in our Q and A uh, session chat. You said by Martin, by the way, you said we were we are past arguing if some bug is really going to be exploited or not. What do you think is the next argument that we should move past? 
Um, all right, so I, I guess I'm gonna be, uh, I'm gonna keep beating that same drum. I think it's, um, I, I think we spend too much time arguing about whether something is a good idea, right? We're like whether a sort of mitigation really works or not, whether, um, uh, you know, kind of I'm, I'm thinking of, uh, uh, you know, Halver uh, Flake's kind of uh, mitigator and, or uh, kind of, um, the spenders kind of opinions on uh, kind of what mitigations really work in Linux and so on. I think, I mean, they're, they're interesting intellectual arguments, they're interesting academic arguments, but really we have to rely more on, kind of on the evolutionary and the scientific process, right? Uh, you don't make progress by just by kind of thinking really hard about what's a good idea um, and then stopping there, right? You have to then test it out and see if your hypothesis was correct, right? So again, we need this feedback mechanism that will allow us to try lots of different things uh, and not get hung up about kind of, um, kind of, or kind of philosophical or maybe arguments about whether a certain mitigation is good or bad. We should be able to look at the data and see whether that mitigation is working or not, right? Whether it's actually making users uh, safer or not. I have another one, which is very much connected to your take on reliability being one of the latest features that products aim for. Do you think that this curve will go down again? If I look at some product categories, again, let's, let's not talk too much about smartphones because both of us would have to talk to some lawyers maybe. <laughs> but um, if I think about whatever, washing machines, to, to take another example, it probably also works for cars. I feel that reliability is actually going down over the decades, that maybe it was an argument that your washing machine would run for 20 years. It no longer is one. Yeah. Um, at the moment, we are back into the feature cycle. Hey, this washing machine is like PV6. Isn't that cool in itself? Wouldn't you want it because of that? Um, so do you, do you think that this is a, a curve that saturates at some point or um, based on the product category and based on whatever the current market hype is, can it, can it actually regress back down again? Is that something that you, that you would expect also in the mobile and IoT space to, to happen, to, to have a little bit of back and yeah, forth? Yeah, th th uh, absolutely. I, I mean, I think reliability regresses. I'm not sure about security, but uh, I mean, I, I don't necessarily see Kind of in terms of that curve, I think it's just basically, it's a second wave, so to speak, right? You know, using the terminology of today, you get a second wave, you get a third wave. In fact, I mean, we already saw something like this with phones, right? Like with battery life, right? Like, you know, the phone that I showed from 95, right? You know, back then, like we had a week of battery life, right? That was, you know, you want to be able to go for a week between charges, right? Like now we're lucky if we can last the day, right? And that's because obviously, you know, you have this kind of huge color display and a lot of other things, right? And a much more powerful processor. Uh, so, so you have certain kind of reliability things that are, uh, they degrade because consumers embrace new functionality, new features. Yeah, so for washing machines, somebody really wants kind of is buying a new washing machine for kind of for Wi-Fi connectivity. Uh, and they're willing to kind of uh, to, to trade longevity for it, then uh, that's what happens. But again, right, we, you know, largely these are the choices we make as consumers, uh, right? It's like you, in most cases, like you don't have to buy the Wi-Fi machine, right? Like, in, like we didn't have to use Zoom. Uh, we could have tried something more secure, but then it would probably, you know, I probably need more than 15 minutes for the AV check. I don't know. Um. Alex, I do fully share your concerns about the mm -hmm. Zoom client. And um, as you so acutely mentioned at the start of your presentation, there are reasons why we mm -hmm. chose it. Not only because our university actually has a campus license for that, which allows us to use all those features without um, paying from the conference budget, which we don't have. <laughs> So yes, there are reasons. Um, if we don't see any other questions right now, then um, I would like to close this excellent keynote session. Thank you again, Alex, for doing that. 
um, it was very much appreciated.